Okay, so if, if anybody uh, doesn't want their image being recorded, you can turn your video off. Um, a couple notes, you know, this is one of 18 different sessions that we're having uh, for the uh, expo and it's gonna be spanning this weekend and the next two weekends. So I know that we've got a lot of folks coming in from the Penn Show and a lot of folks coming in uh, from Cheryl directly. So if you're not familiar with the St. Louis Penn Show and it's something you think you might be interested in, you can stop by stlpenshow.com slash schedule to see what other types of um, sessions and seminars that we've got coming up. So uh, I am keeping everybody on mute. Uh, you know, we're up to 73 people right now. We're expecting as many as about 150, 160 people. And a lot of the background noise, uh, it's hard to find people and mute them. So I'm just going to ask that everyone stay on mute. You can unmute yourself if you have a question. Feel free to do that. But just to kind of limit the background noise, we'd appreciate it if you would stay on mute. Okay, I th think that's all that I've got. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn things over to Cheryl. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I, I know you've got your phone. So which which one do you want me to spotlight? Uh, the one that's not VIP, that does not have the picture. Um, okay. I, I will later on start the picture on my phone and have you spotlight that one. Perfect. So, so for now, I'm just going to be talking a little bit and I'm trying to <laughs> save, save my uh, phone from blowing up on me because it's an older phone and it's been overheating. So I'm trying to wait until we actually need it before we, uh, we start that up. So thank you all for being here. I really appreciate that you have signed up for this class. Uh, I know I've got a lot of people here that I know, people that I know uh, personally, uh, students of mine, I thank you all for being here, whether you know me or not. And I hope you're gonna have a wonderful time. So what we're gonna do today is I am going to basically walk you through a little bit about the background of calligraphy, and I'm going to show you some examples of what constitutes calligraphy. And uh, I'm also going to demonstrate some calligraphy for you. So we're going to be doing a bunch of things today, and it's going to be boom, 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 boom. So it's going to be pretty fast. And I sent everybody, hopefully you all got, <laughs> since you're here, hopefully you all got the email that not only has the Zoom link, but has the handouts. And if you didn't get a chance to print out the handouts, that's okay. I basically wrote them with the idea that they would be a reminder of what we did rather than you need to follow them slavishly during this session. So hopefully that will work out for you. So you can print them out if you want to uh, or not. If you don't want to, that's fine, whichever way works for you. So what we're gonna do to start off is I'd like to do a little sort of slideshow to uh, start us off and just give you an idea of some of the things that I have done in my career. Just a little bit of background on me is um, I've been doing calligraphy for about 40 years <laughs> at this point, believe it or not. And uh, I started when I was in junior high school and didn't do a lot with it until after I was out of college and then I started my business and um, I've, been, I've been doing calligraphy professionally ever since. That was in 1993. So almost 30 years at this point that I have been uh, in business doing calligraphy. And my specialties are calligraphy for weddings and also the engrossed documents, the, the highly decorated documents from around the turn of the century. So, um, you know, the traditional kind of thing. I do a lot of contemporary stuff as well, but those are my specialties. So that's what I do. I really, really love what I do. As my friends who are on here will tell you, uh, I basically talk to, calligraphy, uh, talk to anybody about calligraphy if they stand still long enough. So I just, I, I really, really enjoy what I do. And I hope that this will help you to catch the passion that I have for calligraphy by me showing you what I do and what can be done with calligraphy. So without further ado, let's see. 
Hopefully this will work. We're going to attempt to share the screen. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see this. Um, you should see a big uh, letter S with a vine on it. Is, Ken, is that what you're seeing? I am seeing it, yes, too, but I'd like to get some of the uh... Uh, the folks in here to, to see if you're seeing her screen with the big purple and gold S larger or if you're seeing her video window larger. Yeah, it looks like everyone can see it. We should be good. Okay, good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I will be honest with you all. This is by far the, the biggest class I've ever taught. And normally I teach classes of no more than about 12 people. So this is, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're having adventures with scaling up. I want to make sure that everybody has a good experience. So sometimes we may need to check some things just to make sure. Okay, so what we are going to do here is I'm going to move this over. And I'm just going to quickly go through this material that I have for you. And I'm just going to very, very briefly talk about each thing as it comes up. Uh, this is an example. Uh, the person that I did this for is on this call, so um, she will be seeing this. Uh, I like to use my calligraphy in my personal life. I like to use it to make bookmarks for gifts. It's a really wonderful opportunity, especially if you have a lot of friends that read. This is a really wonderful gift. And so this is one that I made for a friend whose name starts with S. And uh, this is something that I teach in some of my classes. And I did the background as well, but that's not something I teach, it's marbling. I learned that someplace else, but I did that background as well. Um, here's some more bookmarks that I did uh, for the same friend who's a Harry Potter fan and an Outlander fan like I am. So this is the front of the bookmarks. And by the way, I usually laminate my bookmarks. I take them to Office Depot or someplace like that, and I laminate them so as to protect them. And uh, this is before they were laminated. And by the way, the background on this is paste paper. Paste paper. Paste as in glue. And if you're not familiar with paste paper, I recommend that you Google it and look it up. It's a lot of fun. It's like finger painting for adults. That's what it is. So these are the backs of those two bookmarks that you just saw. So you can see what that looks like. And then here's another bookmark. Um, I love this particular piece of paste paper that I made. And then this, I, I wanted to bring this up because it's just kind of a collection of different possibilities of things that you can do with the different styles and um, monograms and things like that. What I did with this was I had a client who asked me to make some note cards and she didn't absolutely require this. As a matter of fact, I don't think she even thought of it, but she wanted about 10 note cards done for a friend for a gift. And I decided to make every single one different. So this is the first five and this is the second five. So you can see that they're all different. I used, I think I used three different styles here. I used, uh, I used copper plate and italic and Spencerian, and then I use some different decorative techniques for these. So that's what that is. This is uh, Unctual with Celtic knots. Unctual is the style that I teach in my beginner class for absolute beginners who have no experience whatsoever. Uh, that's the lettering style that's used here. And then the Celtic knots, that's something else I teach. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be teaching this for the pen show next weekend. So if you take that class, you will know how to do this Celtic knot by the end of that two, two and a half hour class. So there's still some room in that class if you wanted to sign up for that. So I don't want to be too much of a shill for my other classes, but uh, if you're interested in that, that's how you can learn to do that if you're interested. Okay, this is a certificate that I did. And this uses unctual and some decorated letters, some italic and some copper plate. Uh, this is 
um, watercolor pencil lettering and also a watercolor leaf um, background. So that's what that is. This is some more contemporary lettering. Uh, I call it Formo lettering because that's the name of the person who uh, created it that I learned it from. So that's what that is. And then this is some of the more traditional stuff. This is another decorated letter with a vine on it. And this is something I did quite a while ago. This is black letter with what's called a Dutch cap. And uh, the, the big B, that's the Dutch cap. And it is, uh, as you can see, it's highly decorated with pointed pen. And it's just, uh, it's, it's a really interesting process to do. It's very organic. There's no there's not a lot of rules to tell you how to do this. You just have to practice and uh, look for how it all goes together. And then this is another certificate that I did. This is for a class that I was in. It's traditional in the calligraphy world for people who do a long course, uh, like a year-long course or a course that's comparable to a college course traditionally. This is something they were doing a lot in the 19th century and turn of the century. And uh, it was traditional for people to make their own certificate when they were done. And then their instructor would sign it. And uh, basically it was proof that you learned how to do the techniques because you would demonstrate them on your certificate. Uh, so this was traditional for penmanship, engrossing, calligraphy, uh, classes that were on the longer side. So this is what happened with that. And this actually is not finished. Uh, I would normally be doing some more things to that big H and some other stuff, but uh, I really, really like the way the leaf and vine design came out on this one. So I wanted to show you that. This is something I did as an exercise for the fracture class that I taught recently. I just fell in love with this style, so I was really happy to have the opportunity to learn it uh, not too terribly long ago. And I taught a class in it, and this is something that I did for that class. This is my entry in the Graceful Envelope Contest. And if you look at the uh, calligraphy resources page that I gave you, you will see that I have information on there about the Graceful Envelope Contest. Uh, and it's basically you know, this is a little bit about it. And if you want to know more, go to this website. Uh, I entered this contest in 2013 and several of my students and I agreed that we were going to enter it. I had never entered a calligraphy contest before in my 30 some, roughly 30 years of doing calligraphy. So this was the first time. And um, you only get one option or one chance per year. And they have a theme and you're judged on the quality of your lettering and the quality of your design and how will you incorporate the stamp into the design and all that sort of thing. And um, you only get one chance and it has to go through the mail. You can't put it in another envelope to protect it going through the mail, which is really unnerving. I can tell you, you, you kind of, uh, you take it to the post office and ask them to hand cancel it. And they look at you like, I just work here. I really don't care about your envelope. You know, <laughs> sometimes postal employees are like that. And uh, then you just cross your fingers and hope it gets there safely. So I sent this off. I did not even know if they'd received it because they don't send you a confirmation until I got a certificate in the mail about three months later that said, congratulations, you've been awarded best in show. So um, if you go to the website for, uh, for the Graceful Envelope Contest and you go to where they show the winners for 2013, you will see a picture of this envelope on there because it won Best in Show that year. So uh, I have not entered a calligraphy contest since because I sort of feel like, where do you go from here? <laughs> you know, um, as one of my friends said, you might as well go out on top, right? Well, okay, 
And so that was what this one was. So I teach an artistic envelopes class where I talk about decorating envelopes. I teach you a bunch of easy techniques for decorating envelopes. You don't even have to have had any calligraphy experience. All you have to have is, you know, basic, basic uh, skills, you know, nothing fancy, and you can decorate envelopes. I'm teaching that in two weeks for the pen show. So uh, if you're interested in decorating envelopes, that's a class you can take. Okay, this is something that I was really very proud of. This was, I don't know, any other Outlander fans out there? Uh, if there are, you will recognize this. Yes, I see some waving hands. Um, you will recognize what this is from. Uh, the Outlander, if, for those who don't know, Outlander was originally a series of books by Diana Gabaldon, and uh, she's still writing them. And in 2014, I think it was, they came out with a show uh, based on the books. And when they did that, they invited people to create a wedding invitation for the main characters. That was a fandom thing. Well, I didn't find out about it early enough to enter the competition, but I did this on my own. And this has about maybe about 50 hours of research in it because of the few pieces of information you have to have for a wedding invitation, only about half of them were clear from the books. So I had to figure out or invent the other half. And so I had a bunch of tabs open on my computer. I had everything from, um, you know, who's the patron saint of travelers and um, did, uh, was Scotland in 1743 on the Gregorian or the Julian calendar system? All this sort of stuff. I had a lot of research in this and I was really pleased with the way it came out. Um, and I was going to sell these personalized and um, apparently the company that put up the show felt that it violated their copyright. So I'm not able to sell them anymore, but I can show them to you. <laughs> so that was that. And this is a close up of the monogram that I created. This is hand painted. The invitation itself is printed except for the personalization of the guest name but the monogram is hand painted and I'm going to show you a variation of this later on in this class. And this is, you can see, I took a picture here of the monograms painted in different colors, depending on what people might want. This is another invitation that I did. And I, my personal preference is not to use quite this much flourishing. But this is what the client wanted. So they just wanted flourishing out the wazoo. So we did flourishing out the wazoo and they seemed to be very happy with it. So that was the invitation with the response card and envelope. This was the addressing for that same invitation. This is something that I, this is a work in progress. This is something that I was working on recently for a class I took last year. Uh, thank you, pandemic. It's given us the opportunity to take all these wonderful classes and I have been doing a lot of that myself. This is uh, something I created in a class that I took with Heather Held. Those of you who are longtime calligraphers will be familiar with her. She specializes in Victorian themed or Victorian style uh, pointed pen decorative work. And as you can see, one of them is already painted. The other one is not yet painted. The one in front is not yet painted, but it will be painted when it's done. And I just, I really love her style. So I was really pleased to have the opportunity to study this technique with her. And once I have a little more practice with it under my belt, I'm going to be teaching this too. This is another invitation that I did a few years back. And this one is, I feel it has a, a balance between flourishes and not so much flourishing that I like better. I think this is more balanced than the one that's just all flourishes. But you know, everybody has their own preferences. I like to use some flourishes to help show that it was done by hand, but 
you still want to be able to read it. So uh, I always try to find that balance as best I can. This is some more contemporary lettering that I did just as a little exercise and it has some glitter glue on it to just bling it up a little bit. This is something I did as an example of some of the monograms that I've done, because a lot of times people ask me to do monograms, especially for weddings. Sometimes it's two initials, sometimes it's three initials, sometimes it's just one initial. The one in the middle, the MG, that's kind of my specialty. Uh, I do a lot of these. Uh, it has what I call a cloud of flourishes around it, and that I can tell you take some doing to sort out because it takes a while to plan out all those flourishes and sketch them in and say, no, this looks too crowded over here. What if I take that one out and balance it by another one over here? That takes a while. Um, that might take, well, let me, let me put it to you this way. I had a client a few years ago and the, the monogram, um, it's not on this page, but the this was a two letter monogram. The three letter monogram is on this page, but the two letter monogram I did for the same client is not on this page. The two letter monogram. Uh, this was a very particular client and they what I usually do is I do some pencil sketches when somebody asks for a monogram. I do some pencil sketches first and I send it to the client and I say, okay, tell me if any of these is in the right direction of what your vision is for this monogram. And if they say, yes, this is kind of what I want, then I start refining that. I ask them questions about how it falls short of what they have in mind, that sort of thing. Those are supposed to be just rough sketches. I tell people to think of that as a sketch on the back of a napkin. You know, it's not refined. And um, so I sent the client about 12 sketches. And uh, the way they, they came back to me, they said, well, we kind of like this one, but can you move this over a millimeter? And can you move this up just a hair this way? And I couldn't seem to get across to them that it was really supposed to just be a rough draft and we were going to refine it later. I was trying to find out if we were going in the right direction or not. So everything that I did, they wanted it all refined. And so that took a lot longer than it normally would have. I ended up doing, I kid you not, 58 versions of that monogram, most of which was highly refined versions. So there was an enormous amount of work in that two letter monogram. So sometimes that happens, but you know, they didn't complain about paying the bill. So uh, I was okay with it. Uh, but you know, that's sometimes people just really wanna see exactly what it's going to be. Uh, this, I wanted to show you, this is that MG monogram. I just wanted you to see this up more up close and personal so that you could see what all goes into it. So what I've tried to do here is balance the weight of the flourishes so that Everything looks, um, I keep coming back to the word balanced uh, and nothing looks too crowded or too loose or too open and everything is centered properly. That's the goal with this. So that's, that's a whole lot of work right there. Uh, even though it's just two letters, it's a lot of work. So this is just an example of a contemporary style that I did. This was a name tag that I did for one of my students with some decorative techniques on there. I teach some of these decorative techniques in my artistic envelopes class. I think this actually was a, I think this was actually a name card for my artistic envelopes class. Um, this was fun. Sometimes I'm asked to do monograms that are then, or monograms or phrases or something that are then put on napkins. And the reflective uh, gold isn't showing up so well in these photographs, but the one on the bottom says Allison and Joe, and it has that sort of cloud of flourishes around it. Not quite as many flourishes as the M MG monogram, but it's all on there. And these are more bookmarks for Outlander fans, which other Outlander fans will recognize uh, what's on here. Uh, so that's more um, bookmarks that are not yet 
not, not yet laminated. And this is a piece that I was really pleased with. Uh, this was uh, something I did a few years ago, and it's, it's practice in working with unctual and italic and working in circles. I actually have a class just for working in circles and spirals. There's a whole class just for that. And uh, also some color blending. So I have this hanging on my wall um, in my house. So I really, really like the way this turned out. This is another example of the decorated letter that I'm going to be showing you today, or I'm going to show you a variation of this today and the leaf and vine with a poem that I did for a client. This is another piece that I was really, really pleased with. This was a baby announcement that I did for a client. She wanted lots of flourishes filling up the space. She wanted it on the diagonal. She wanted it bleeding off the edge, the, the flourishes bleeding off the edge. This is what it looked like when I sent it to the printer. And this is not a great photograph, but it was uh, letter pressed. This is what it looked like when it was done. So, and it was a baby girl, so it's in pink. And as I said, this is not a great photograph, but it turned out really nice. This is another um, decorative thing. Uh, these, these make great gifts. You know, they have the name on there. So this is a more contemporary technique. This is another more traditional certificate I did. This was for a legal organization. So um, they're, you know, on the conservative side, they don't want a lot of wild and crazy uh, modern stuff on there. So that was, uh, you know, a little bit more traditional. And these are some gifts that I did for some of my students uh, with some decorative stuff on there. This is a a little bit more contemporary. Uh, it's what you might call modern calligraphy. It's kind of a restrained form of modern calligraphy, but technically it is modern calligraphy. It's a modern calligraphy for the most part is a variation of copper plate. If you're familiar with those terms, if you're not familiar with those terms, that's okay. We'll get into that a little bit later. And this is another certificate I was really pleased with. This is sort of the top half of the certificate. This uses that leaf and vine design, that heart with the top hat in the middle, that is the logo of one of the two organizations that was involved with this certificate. And you can see the little heart echoed, not only in the vines, but in the hearts in the corners. And then this is the bottom half of the certificate. And I, uh, had the, the joy of tracing the other, <laughs> the other logo, the Stewart Family Foundation logo on the bottom. That was fun. So this is the bottom half of the certificate. This was an adventure. I can tell you, uh, these are table numbers on velvet. Have you ever tried to write on velvet, put ink on velvet? What happens? it sucks up all your ink. Uh, and these were double-sided, double by the way. So I had to do all the stuff on one side and then do the same thing on the other side. I think there were about 35 of these. And each one, I had to go over it and over it and over it to get enough ink on there that it would show up. This is gold ink. And then I had to wait for everything to dry, flip it over and do it all again. And it took a long time. And there's probably about $2, $1.50 to $2 worth of ink on each of these cards when you count both sides. I mean, I, I was afraid I was going to run out of ink and I thought I had plenty when I started because it sucked up so much of the ink into the velvet. So it was an adventure. I mean, they really turned out nice, but <laughs> it was an adventure. I got to tell you. Okay. So that is the end of the slideshow. So I hope that's been informative in kind of giving you an idea of the range of different things that I've done in my career, different things that calligraphers do. And, uh, you know, it's just never a dull moment. I tell you, I've written on basketballs. I've written on um, coolers, like a cooler that you keep uh, cold drinks in. 
I've, I've written on that. I've written on conductor's batons. I've written on piggy banks. I mean, <laughs> almost any surface you can think of, I've written on. And it's always interesting to see what <laughs> clients are going to come up with. You just never know. So, okay. How's everybody doing so far? I'm looking at the comments. I couldn't look at the comments while I was doing the slideshow, but yeah. Yeah, my friend who uh, received some of these bookmarks is saying they look familiar. Okay, good. All right, I'm looking for comments, questions, anything. Yeah, we got some Outlander fans here. That's good. Um, I have a question. How long does it take to get the finished pieces done? Well, it depends on which finished piece it is. You know, some things are a lot faster than others. Um, my bookmarks, usually those take about an hour, depending on whether they're single-sided or double-sided. Um, if I do a, um, a wedding invitation, uh, when I do a, a complete wedding invitation, what I do is I do one version. Of course, I plan it out and do rough drafts and everything first, but when I do a wedding invitation, I essentially do the finished version once i put it in i scan it in put it in photoshop you know twiddle things in photoshop and send it off to the printer and that might take you know depending on a lot of different factors like how many pieces there are in the invitation and what style it is and how much flourishing there is and all that sort of thing um it might take 10 hours might take 20 hours might take 25 hours i did one that had even more flourishing than the most flourished one that I showed you. And that probably took me close to 30 hours to do. And there were only three pieces in it. So it was a lot of work. It really is. Um, I see a question about what kind of gold ink I'm using. Um, the, my favorite gold ink is something that I'm going to show you in a few minutes, you know, later on in the class here. My favorite gold ink is Fine Tech, also known as Calero, Arabic Gold. That's my absolute favorite. And it is listed, if you're not quite catching what I'm saying, um, it is listed in the information in the handouts that I gave you. So that's listed in there. It's Fine Tech, which is also sometimes called Calero, Arabic Gold color. Okay, it's a really beautiful, metallic watercolor. It comes in a bunch of different colors. It's all metallic and they're really pretty. They work really well for both painting and lettering. So it's a really, really nice ink. I mean, it just came out, I don't know, maybe seven to 10 years ago. And I just love it. And most of my students love it. And most of my colleagues love it. It's absolutely my favorite. And it comes in lots of pieces, uh, lots of, lots of different colors, excuse me. Um, Okay, how does one do the writing lines? Well, I work on a light box. And if you're not quite as old school as me, you can work on a light pad. You can buy those on Amazon and a lot of other places. I don't know if you can see here behind me. This is my easel, uh, which is the surface that I write on. This right here, which you probably can't see very well. This is my, um, this is, these are my lines. And I can turn on the light. On my light box there it is it's got an actual old-fashioned fluorescent light bulb in there the newer ones are more electronic they're only about this thick mine is two inches thick because it actually has a fluorescent bulb in there and uh, so i turn on the light and then i lay my paper over it so like this i laid over that and i know there's too much glare for you to really be able to see what's going on here but what happens is if everything is working correctly, you can see the lines through your paper. So you don't have to draw lines on your envelope or whatever it is that you're writing on. So that makes it a lot easier. So uh, that's, that's uh, the best way to do it, unless you're working with dark paper or something like that. And then for that, I have other techniques that I use. And if you want to know about that, that's something that I teach in the full version of my artistic envelopes class, which I'm not teaching until November. The one I'm teaching in two weeks is just about decorating envelopes, uh, but the full 
artistic envelopes class includes not just decorating, but also how to line dark envelopes and how to lay out envelopes and a bunch of other things all about envelopes. It's just, I didn't know if anybody would want to sit for a six hour class right off the bat. So I'm just concentrating on the decorative part of it for the class that we're teaching, that I'm teaching in two weeks. So that's how it works. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, you're very welcome. Okay. Are there any other questions? I'm not seeing any other questions on here. I hope I didn't miss anything. Okay. So next what i'm going to do is i am going to switch over yes so everybody hang tight for just a minute i am going to switch over ken to um get my <laughs> get my video going here let's flip this over oh there we go how nice yeah that's good. Nice, Linda. All righty. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, Linda, Linda's got some Marie Angel kind of stuff in there. That's good. Nice. Good. Okay. Oh, look at that. That's great. Okay, now, Ken, uh, if you want to switch over for my uh, my other camera, if you can find that, there we go. Okay, can everybody see my desk okay? See my hand on my desk? Can everybody see that? Oh, the paper for the bookmarks, I usually just use um, Arsh text wove paper, which is the same paper that I'm going to be using for the project that um, I'm going to be showing you here in a little bit. Okay, and the reason I do that is just because I usually work on paste paper and that's my favorite paper to use for paste paper. It holds up really well to the water. So that's good. All right, good, everybody can see it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is we are going to take a brief walk through the history of calligraphy. Here we go, hang on. There we go. Sorry about the jumping around. I do not have a nice sophisticated document camera where I can just push a button and zoom in and all that sort of thing. I have to do it the slightly less sophisticated way by using my phone as my camera. So that's what we're going to do here. All right. Now, let me see here. Okay, here we go. Now, the tool I'm going to be using initially here is called a parallel pen. And this is a cartridge pen. I'll talk to you a little bit more about tools in a little bit. But it's a cartridge pen. And you can buy them at a lot of ink, a lot of uh, art stores, parallel pens. They are a broad edged calligraphy pen. And what that means is if I pull the pen this way, I get a thin line. If I pull the pen this way, I get a thick line. So a broad edged, uh, a broad edged pen means you get thinner or thicker lines depending on which direction you pull it. And if I have my pen angled this way, I get a thin line if I go like that and a thick line if I go like that because if you look at this, you see it's wider in this direction than it is in this direction. See, that's just the thickness of two thin pieces of metal. This way, it's 3.8 millimeters. So that is how that works. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a brief walk through the history of calligraphy. Now, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, this is not a complete history, okay? I'm not going to pretend that it's a complete history. We are skipping through the ages and I'm only landing on the styles that I feel comfortable showing you, demonstrating for you. Okay, so we're going to start off in the Roman, Roman era, time of Christ, you know, first century BC or AD, 
somewhere in there. And at that time, the big thing was the Roman capitals. So let's see here, Roman. And the reason I'm just writing out these words, some of these words uh, with a normal pen is if I write all of this out in calligraphy, we will be here all day and we won't get to everything that I want to do today. So that's why I'm doing it this way. So the Roman capitals are the big, bold capital letters like so. And this particular style is not my area of expertise, but I do know how to do it. So that's what that looks like. You know, you've heard of Times Roman. This is like that. And the most famous example of Roman capitals is called the Trajan Column. And that is a feature in Rome, the Trajan Column. So the Roman capitals that we're familiar with are based on the letters that were cut into the stone of the Trajan Column in Rome. Next, we are going to, let's see, first century, okay? Next, we are going to about the fourth century. And by the way, these dates are not very exact, but it's in the vicinity. So next, we're going to go to Ireland. We're going from Italy. Now we're going to Ireland or Unkshaw. And Unkshaw is the style I teach in my first class for beginners because it's one of the easiest ones to learn. And we do use this parallel pen in that class. So here we go. And unctual is one of the easier ones because it's based on circles. And it's upright instead of slanted. And you may have noticed that I'm working without lines. So these, <laughs> I may not get as straight a, a line as possible uh, because I'm working without lines just to allow me to go a little bit more freely. But this is the style I teach in my first class for beginners. So we spend 10 weeks working with this, not only with this style, but working on a lot of other aspects of calligraphy that are fundamental to the study of calligraphy. I'm not just in that class. I don't just teach a style. I teach you, you know, I assume you don't know anything about calligraphy when you start that class. So I teach you how to work with the pen. I teach you how to work with the ink. I teach you how to work with guidelines. I teach you how to um, how to do envelopes. I teach you how to work with the light box. I teach you how to create a finished piece. All of these things that are really important if you're going to continue to study calligraphy. My goal with that class is even if for whatever reason you never take another calligraphy class in your life, you will have a good solid foundation. That's my goal with that class. That's why it's 10 weeks, even though this is one of the easiest styles to learn because I wanna give you as much time as possible to practice these techniques and also learn some of these other fundamentals. We also just sort of touch on things like dip pens and pointed pen and a bunch of things like that. So yeah, yep, exactly. 
So that is the unctual style. Also, unctual does not have capitals and lowercase, so there's not as many forms to learn. Okay, so that's the fourth century, Ireland. And uh, then we move on to approximately the ninth century. And that is going to be black letter. So black letter, move this up a little bit. There we go. Black letter is also known as the picket fence style, which you will notice with the lowercase letters because they are black, white, black, white, black, white, like a picket fence. And you'll see that in just a minute when I get done with this here. And black letter, as you can see, is a very slow style. It takes a long time to do it. And this was developed in around the ninth century. Um, it's particularly, um, particularly associated with Germany. And it is, you know, you need both the broad part and the corner of the pen to really do it in its full form. You can do it with just the, the regular broad edge, but it looks better if you use the corner to add some little accents as well. So this is what this looks like. And you want this to be as even as possible, which this one is not quite as even as I would like. And here we go. Like so. So you can see how this goes. Uh, by the way, I'm seeing that um, there's some questions. Yes, this is a Pilot Parallel Pen. That is correct. It's made by Pilot, but everybody calls them Parallel Pens. Yes, there are left-handed versions of most of these kinds of pens. For those of you who are left-handed, I taught a lot of left-handed people. As a matter of fact, one of my left-handed students is in this class today, and I think she's making some comments. There we go. And one of the difficulties with black letter is to make sure that the uh, the letters are not uh, running into each other because sometimes it's hard to tell where one letter ends and the next one begins. And by the way, I would not be at all surprised if I make a spelling error because I'm trying to talk and write at the same time. <laughs> so if I do, don't be surprised. And uh, I will tell you, I get this from my students all the time. Oh, I thought I did really well, and then I realized I left out a letter or I misspelled something. Uh, it happens to me too. <laughs> it happens to everybody. So look at this. If I cover up this, cover up the bottoms and the tops, obviously there's some gaps in there, but if you write a word like minimum that doesn't have any letters that have those gaps in them, it'll look like a picket fence if it's done correctly. So that's called the picket fence style. So that's black letter. All right, let's see. Now, the next one we're gonna go to, we're moving up to the 14th century, the Renaissance, 14th century, okay. 
and this is the Renaissance era, era when everything was graceful and beautiful and lovely. And this is where you get italic. So this is one of the most versatile styles you can have. And traditionally, it's written at a slant. Uh, although I often write it straight up and down, it's versatile that way. But traditionally, it's on the slant. So that's italic, and you can see my black letter is going uphill here, but that's okay. As I said, I knew there would be issues with that because I'm working without lines, but I think it's more attractive um, for the purposes of what we're doing here. Okay, so that's four, 14th century back to Italy, you know, hence the name italic. So that is 14th century. Now we are moving on to the 16th century. And as I said, these dates are very approximate, so don't get hung up on that. Now, we are going back to a variation of black letter called fracture. And this, again, is a very Germanic style. And this is another style that I had the opportunity to study in greater depth recently, and I just love it. I like it much better than regular black letter, to be honest with you. And it's sort of like black letter with a twist. So it's got these lovely little bits and pieces so it's it's got a little more swing to it than black letter does it's still pointy but it's got more swing You can see the swing here in the U. And we go down so it's a little bit softer look than the black letter okay so you see it's it's just it's got a little bit more movement in it than the black letter does so that's 16th century now we are going to switch over to the pointed pen. So we are leaving the realm of the cartridge pen, which is easier to use, and moving to the realm of the dip pen. Now, this right here is a broad edge dip pen. So all of the stuff that I was doing up here, I could do it with this pen instead. And instead of having the ink delivered by a cartridge, it would be delivered, you can either dip it, hence the name, you can dip it in the ink, or you can do what I do and use a brush to load the ink on. And this is what I tend to do uh, almost all the time, and it's what I teach my students to do, because there's certain kinds of 
situations where you really need to be able to load the pen with a brush. And I find that it gives me more control. So that's what I do on a regular basis is I use the brush to dip into the ink. So let's see here. Let's see if I've got my ink the correct consistency. I'll tell you one of the biggest issues that people have in the beginner classes is trying to get their ink the right consistency. Okay, hang on a second. Here we go. Okay, now, 18th, 19th century. Now, the reason I put two dates on here is in the 18th century, they were doing a variation of what I'm about to show you, but they were doing it with a different tool, so it looked different. I'm turning everything here. Hang on. So in the 19th century, they finally came up with the kind of tools that I am using now, or a you know, pretty close resemblance to them. And so the, the lettering changed a little bit, but it was basically the same style in the 18th century, maybe a little bit farther back but it didn't look exactly the same because they used a different tool. So in the 18th century, they were using a quill for this, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. And in the 19th century, around 1830, 1840, they started uh, develop mass producing metal nibs. And a little bit later on, they came up with the oblique holder, which is what I'm using here. The oblique holder, by the way, offsets the point so that it's not parallel to the shaft part of the pen holder, the part I actually am holding in my hand, it's offsetting it. And the reason most right-handers do this style with uh, an oblique holder is because you want the slant, oh, I've got a fuzzy on here. Uh, you want the slant of the letters and the long axis of the nib to be parallel. And because this is a very steeply slanted style, you don't have to turn the paper quite as much if you're using an, uh, an oblique holder. So that's why you can do that. Now, if you're a lefty, you have an advantage, especially if you're the kind of lefty that comes from underneath rather than, you know, a hook kind of lefty. If you're the coming from underneath kind of lefty, kind of like a right-hander, but you hold it with your left hand, then you're an advantage. You don't need an oblique holder. You can just hold a straight holder and you'll already be at just about the right angle. So you that's an advantage for lefties. And all the lefties are saying, well, finally, there's an advantage to being left-handed. How long have I been waiting for that, right? Yeah, I, I hear you. Okay, so this is most people today call this copper plate. It is also known as English round hand or engrosser's script or engraver's script, but most people today call it copper plate. Not everybody, but if you hear engrosser's script or engraver's script or English round hand, this is what they're talking about. And this is done with a pointed pen. And what that means is it's a flexible nib and the way you get the thicks and thins is by putting pressure on it. So when you put pressure on it, the tines of the nib spread apart and the ink goes across the space between them and that's how you get a thicker stroke. And then if you don't put any pressure on it, you get a thin stroke like I'm getting here. So. by coming around like that, like so. And you see what I'm doing here. I'm loading my nib over my cover sheet. And by the way, I also teach my students to use a cover sheet because otherwise you may have a mess on your hands. So 
So I don't know how well you can see what I'm doing here, but you only put pressure on it when you're pulling it towards you. And uh, when you're pushing it away from you, you don't put any pressure on it. And that's how you get the thin lines, is no pressure. Clean that up a little bit. So if you try to put pressure on it, pushing it away from you, what will happen? It will catch on the paper and it will spit ink everywhere and you will be cursing yourself. I guarantee you. Sometimes it happens even when you're not putting pressure on it, pushing it away from you, but if you do that, I guarantee it will catch and spit on you. There. And then go back and clean up all the little bits and pieces, square off the tops the way they're supposed to. See, you're technically supposed to square off all these tops and bottoms, like so. So that is what copper plate looks like. This is actually a slightly fancier version of copper plate than I teach in my beginning copper plate class. This is, I call it Bickham. It's based on a style developed uh, or popularized, I wouldn't say developed, but popularized by George Bickham's Universal Penman, which is from the 1740s-ish. So that's what that is. All right, we've got one more here. This is from the 19th century. This is billed as being the first truly American style. It's called Spencerian. It's named after a fellow named Platt Rogers Spencer, uh, who's from Ohio. And that was mid to late 19th century. And it's done with the same kind of pen as the copper plate, but it looks a lot different. Let me show you. Now, the capitals don't look that much different. It's the lowercase that really look different. Watch this. Do you see how different that is? I mean, look at this. In the copper plate, every single letter has thicks and thins. In other words, uh, and the thick parts, we call them shades usually. So every single letter in copper plate, lowercase and uppercase, they all have at least one shade. In Spencerian, most of the lowercase letters do not have any shades, or if they do, it's very, very slight ones. And also, if you look at this, this is more of a running hand. It's more stretched out. You can tell that it was done faster. And the copper plate, I don't know if you noticed while I was writing, but there's a lot of pen lifts in copper plate. Uh, pen lift is when you lift the pen off the page. There's a lot of pen lifts in copper plate. With Spencerian, mostly you just keep writing. You keep the pen on the page and it looks more like cursive. This is, I always say Spencerian is like um, cursive writing with its fancy dress ball clothes on. That's what I always say about it because Spencerian is sort of a fancy form of the cursive that a lot of us learned in school, depending on how old you are. 
they're not really teaching a lot of it anymore. But um, those of us who are a little bit uh, older learned it in school. And um, so this is, it's a relative of what we learned in school. This really isn't. This is kind of a different animal. So I hope this has been helpful seeing this little uh, adventure going through <laughs> going through the years. So once you get past Spencerian, you start to get into the realm of more contemporary kind of lettering, uh, which didn't really start until more like the second half, at least, if not later, of the 20th century. That's, you know, it's a, it's a more contemporary stuff. So this is the more traditional stuff. Modern calligraphy, it is a looser variation of copper plate for the most part. Um, there's other possibilities, like sometimes it's done with brush and different th sorts of things, but in general, it's a variation of copper plate. So that is, let me pull this up so you can see it all together. That is, in a nutshell, I can't seem to get it all <laughs> on the same page at the same time, but that's the history of calligraphy in a nutshell on one page. So that's how that works. So I'm going to set this aside and I wanted to show you very quickly. I want to show you some tools and materials. I'm trying to make sure we have enough time for everything I'm trying to get in here. Okay, tools and materials. I showed you the parallel pens already. Sorry, I have so much stuff sitting around here. I'm trying to find everything that I need. Okay, that can go aside. All right, now, pull this back. Okay, so what I was showing you before was the, there we go, was the parallel pen. As I showed you before, this is just a bigger version of the parallel pen. So this is what this looks like. So this is some metallic right here with a larger size parallel pen. Now, look at this handy dandy little gadget. This is called a scroll pen, and sometimes it's called a split pen. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing I just did, and look what happens. You see how it gives you that split in the middle automatically. You don't have to do anything different. So a scroll pen is a really nice tool to have if you want to do something fancy and you don't want a lot of extra work. So the scroll pen is nice. Um, we have markers. Uh, I do not use markers in my classes because the first time I went to teach calligraphy, when I started my first calligraphy class, started teaching my first calligraphy class, I wanted to try to keep the costs down and keep it easy for students. So I thought about using markers, but the difficulty is they mush down really easily as opposed to metal, and they just are not as precise. And I said, I can't do this. I just don't feel like the quality is gonna be good enough if we work with markers, even though it's easier for the students. So I don't work with markers in my classes, but I carry a broad-edged marker in my purse. This one, this one is from Zig. This is the, this is the small size. So you see, this is the large size. Whoops, here we go. This is the large size, this is the small size. So that way I can do bigger lettering or smaller lettering. So I just have this in case somebody says, oh, uh, here's, here's something for a name tag. You know, you need to do a name tag for yourself. Well, I don't wanna do an ordinary name tag because I'm a calligrapher. So I pull out this thing and I do a name tag with that. And then people are all impressed and they say, oh, you have such beautiful handwriting. And then we have the whole conversation where, where I tell them, this is what I get paid to do. And they look at me as though I've grown two heads because 
somebody gets paid to write things. Yeah. So um, that's what I do for that. Okay, so markers, parallel pens, scroll parallel pens, broad edge dip pens. As I said before, this is a broad edge dip pen. And for that, it's the same sort of thing that I was doing before. So I'm writing the same way as what I've got on the page here, but I'm using actual ink that is not in a cartridge. It's in a, you know, it's in a little bottle or other kind of container. Can you guys see this? There's my ink right there. It's in a container. So there's two containers open because one of them is my rinse water. That's what that is. So it's the same thing, but using uh, ink that doesn't come out of a cartridge. So that's how that works. And you will see more variation in the color with this kind of ink. And Trying to figure out what I did here. Okay. All right. So that is that. Let's see. What else did I want to tell you about? Um, pointed pen. I talked about that already. That's what I used for the copper plate and the Spencerian. Now, this is an interesting thing. I'm not going to demonstrate with this, but I want to show you. This right here, this is a quill. See that? And yeah, there's no little feathery bits on it. What's up with that? Well, as I tell all my students, that thing that they show in historical, uh, historical shows that they say is a quill that you see people writing with, they didn't do that in reality. That's, a, that's Hollywood. That is not the way people actually wrote when they when the quill was all they had. Um, they did not write with that huge, huge feathery thing that looked like it could take the top of your head off. Um, what they would do is, if you look at this, hang on, I've got a regular pen right here. And this one is cut a little on the long side, but they would normally cut a quill to about six inches, seven inches, somewhere around there, just like the same length or roughly the same length as the pens that we use today. And then they would use a special quill knife to cut away part of the quill. This is made from a large feather from a large bird, like a goose or a swan, something like that. You can write with smaller feathers, but the difficulty is because of the smaller radius, it's hard to get a broad edge on it. So you mostly get sort of a point and they also are more fragile. Now, Quills have to be treated in a certain way, and I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but uh, imagine, I mean, quills are made of the same material as your fingernails. It's the same stuff as your fingernails. Imagine what would happen if you, um, if you were able to grow a fingernail in this shape and write with it. How long do you think it would take before it would completely mush down and fall apart, right? So the quills, uh, the feathers have to be treated in a certain way to make them more durable. Um, they're heated and various other sorts of things. So they're treated in a particular way. So there's a whole, you know, there's a whole industry to cutting quills. And people used to do it all the time, but they were taught how to do it, just like we're taught how to do things like drive. And uh, anyway, so they would cut it short so that it would not stick them in the eye and they would strip off the what's called the barbs, which are the feathery bits, so that they would not interfere with the grip. Because, you know, if you've got a bunch of feathery bits on here, it's going to be less comfortable for your hand. Sometimes they'd leave some of them on the end just because it was easier not to mess with them and they didn't really interfere with anything. But for this part, they would almost always strip off the barbs. So you're never going to see historically accurate a person writing with that huge long quill that still has all the barbs on it that just didn't happen they didn't do that so uh my friend who is on here can tell the story of how i would have steam coming out my ears when we would sit and watch historical dramas together because they would be writing with whole feathers instead of proper quills 
And I can tell you, it's, you know, don't ever watch historical fiction with me because I will probably start exploding about the quills before too long. I'm kind of used to it now, but uh, it's a problem. So what I wanted to say about this is the only show or movie that I know of personally, or that I, I should say that I've seen personally that does it correctly is the movie Shakespeare in Love. If you watch the movie Shakespeare in Love, you watch Shakespeare right, there is ink everywhere. That's valid. That's the way it works when you're a calligrapher. You know, my students come in and they say, oh, I've got ink everywhere. I say, welcome to my world. I have ink everywhere too. And uh, so that's valid. And he's not, he does, he's not precious about it. He strips off the barbs and he slices up, you know, he does the quill cutting really fast and he uses it. You know, he doesn't sit there and very carefully carve it away and take a lot of time. No, he's a working writer. He doesn't have time to mess with that. He's got a strike while the inspiration is, is, you know, hot. And so he's got to get this done so he can capture his thoughts. He doesn't have time to spend two hours cutting and stripping the quill. No, it's zip, 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 zip. Okay, start writing. And that is much more accurate. So this is a quill. You can actually buy them uh, pre-made, which is what I do because I have cut quills, but it's not something I'm expert in. Now, this thing right here, this thing right here, this is vellum. It's not paper that's called vellum. It is actual animal skin vellum. And it is a wonderful, wonderful surface to write on if you're a calligrapher. It's very sensual. And it just, if it's properly treated, it feels wonderful. It's very smooth and just lovely. I, I have a lot of colleagues who mostly work on vellum because it is basically the highest quality material you can use, but it's not my preference because I'm vegetarian and I try not to use a lot of animal products. That's my personal preference. It's still a wonderful material to write on, but something has to die to make it available to you. So I'm not really keen on that part of it. So I try to only use vellum when I really need to. So I don't use it a lot. Mostly what I do is I use watercolor paper, hot press watercolor paper. Hot press watercolor paper is like paper that's been ironed with a hot iron. And cold press watercolor paper is like um, watercolor paper that's been ironed with a cold iron. So if you think about uh, what it's like to iron with a hot iron versus ironing with a cold iron, that will give you an idea of how hot press paper is smoother than cold press paper. And I have just now inked the back of my wrist. How about that? Okay, so that is that. Um, okay, what else did I wanna talk about? Oh, uh, automatic pens and ruling pens. Hang on a second. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I'm still trying to do tools and stuff. Okay, so these are what's called automatic pens. And it, they're automatic pens, sort of like automatic drive in the car. Uh, they will take away some of the work, but you still have to do a lot of the work yourself. So these are automatic pens. You dip them. See, the ink goes in that sort of diamond shape space in between. This is a quoit pen. I don't think these are being made anymore. It's the same sort of thing, except there's a little uh, piece of corrugated metal in the middle to help hold the ink. This is a folded pen. Can you see this? There's a little gap in here. I made this one myself. This is, I think, electrical tape of some sort. And this is a piece of a soda can. Actually, it's not a piece of a soda can, but you can use this. Uh, you can do the same thing with a piece of a soda can. And um, let's see here. OK. Um, so this is a folded pen. Some people write with that. I'm not very good with it, so I don't really use it a lot, but a lot of people do. And then the last thing I wanted to show you is the ruling pen. This is a traditional draftsman's ruling pen, and um, it's, it's designed for drawing lines, drawing straight lines. 
if you remember seeing all those certificates that I did with gold outlines all the way around the edge, this is what I used. I used my gold ink and this tool right here. And I teach people how to do this in my classes. So um, that's what we do. Okay, so um, some people do write with this tool. I personally don't, but you can. Um, I am not an expert in that. I've done it, but uh, I'm not very good at it and it doesn't excite me. So that's not what I do. Um, okay, a couple of questions here. Let's see. Yes, uh, I will tell you some of these things that I was showing you, they look very contemporary because they look different in the original, but they have since been updated and most calligraphers today do them in a slightly more updated way, like the unctual. If you look at the fourth century unctual in the fourth century manuscript, it's going to look a little different than what you've seen me do today. So um, it's a little bit different. Um, some of this stuff the scribes did not do doing, during, uh, using quills, or they did it a lot smaller. They did it a lot smaller. Let me be more accurate about that. I have never had an oblique pen made especially for me, no. Um, the reason I brush the ink onto the top of the nib rather than the underside is if the ink blobs, I, if it's on the top, I'm going to be able to see it blobbing and be able to deal with it before it drips on the page. Whereas if it's blobbing when it's underneath, I will not know until it ruins my page. That's why. Oh yes, the ink color is different when I switch from the parallel pen because I was using different ink. The parallel pen is using ink from the cartridge that happens to be blue. And then the ink that I was using with my dip pens happens to be green. It's a totally different kind of ink. I could have found something that was the same color, but there's no reason to do that. It just happens to be a different color of ink, um, also a different kind of ink. Uh, oh yes, <laughs> uh, my friend is, is pointing out that, that this marker works great on styrofoam restaurant takeout boxes too. I used to um, do a party trick where when my friends and I would go out to a restaurant, which of course hasn't happened anytime recently, I would dig this thing out of my purse and put everybody's names on their takeout boxes. and one of my, uh, a couple that I'm friends with, they've kept those takeout boxes that I did for them and they have them framed on the wall. I kid you not. Um, I was sort of astonished when I saw that, but they've got the, the tops of their styrofoam takeout boxes framed on the wall with all my calligraphy on them. So, okay. Let's see. Okay. Um, I would go over the loading with the pen with the brush, but I will run out of time if I don't keep moving. So that is something that will have to wait. Uh, preparing a new nib, that's something else that's going to have to wait. I'd be happy to answer it if we had more time, but I stuffed a lot of material in here. Um, oh, somebody asked about ink labeled indigo gouache. Is there a specific formula? Well. Um, this is one of the most challenging things about working with dip pens is getting the gouache or whatever ink you're using to be the right consistency. The, the ingredients are gouache out of the tube. Gouache is opaque watercolor for those who don't know, um, or more opaque. It's not completely opaque, but more opaque. And a little bit of gum arabic and some distilled water. That's what's in it. Um, gold ink, yes, any kind of gold ink or paint can be burnished. That is correct. Okay, now what I wanted to do next is I want to go over some books really quickly and then get on with the project, which I'm hoping we have time to do. Hang on. Let me pull this up so you can actually see what I'm doing here. There we go. Trying to get that sorted out. Okay, we move over. Oops, there we go. Sorry, I have too much on my desk here. Okay, now in no particular order, just the way I happen to have it stacked up. Here's some books that I really like, and I've listed, I think I've listed all of these or most of them on the resources handout that I gave you. So you don't have to try and write all this down. I think the only one that may not be on there is this one. Um, but this is the Zanarian Manual 
Uh, that's what we call it in the calligraphy industry. And it's just, it's um, from the turn of the century and it's a wonderful manual in copper play. And there's some other stuff, uh, other types of lettering in here, you know, all this sort of stuff. And it's got, um, it's lettering styles that were popular among calligraphers around the turn of the century. Although engrossing is really the more accurate name for that. Engrossing is the art of taking calligraphy and combining it with decorative techniques, traditional decorative techniques like this right here. Unfortunately, everything in this book is black and white. And it, it's just, I mean, these were originally all in color and they're amazing. Um, if you go to IAMPF, which is also in the resource list, they have pictures of some of these things in color, which is incredible. So um, anyway, so they have a bunch of these things in the back, wonderful, wonderful turn of the, excuse me, turn of the century certificates and other wonderful sorts of things. So this is a book that is currently out of print, unfortunately, but you can find a free downloadable copy of it online that you can use for your own personal use only, for your own personal study. And I've given you the link to that in the, um, in the resource list. This one, I don't think this one is in the resource list. This is called the Universal Penman. It's from the 18th century, engraved by George Bickham. And this has a lot of pointed pen lettering in the style that the styles that were popular in that era. And it has some broad edge lettering as well. And some, see, this is a Dutch cap right here with lots of flourishing around it. So some of this was done with a more of a pointed pen kind of a thing. So it's got a lot of beautiful stuff in it as well. Okay, now. How, here we're jumping up to the present day. This just came out about a month ago. It's the 25th edition. A much, much earlier edition of this was my first calligraphy instruction book. I still have it. I think it's the 12th edition published in 1970 something. And it is amazing. It has a bunch of work from contemporary artists. It's not I wouldn't call it great as an instructional manual, but it has a lot of wonderful exemplars. By the way, an exemplar is basically an example of all, the, generally all of the letters of the alphabet. That's an exemplar. This is an exemplar of Roman capitals. It's got a lot of beautiful, beautiful exemplars and a lot of beautiful work from a lot of contemporary artists in the back. Look at this. Look at these beautiful, beautiful things back here. So this is the Speedball textbook. It's a wonderful resource for anybody who's interested in calligraphy. This is my number one recommended resource. It's called The Foundations of Calligraphy. It's by Sheila Waters, who is my first calligraphy teacher. I was self-taught for the first 17 years. I was a calligrapher. And uh, then I found out they were having a calligraphy conference um, <laughs> in St. Louis where I live. And so I went and the first class I took was with Sheila Waters. She had at that time, she was being given an award for being in the business for 50 years. And this was in 1997, okay? She's amazing. I was supposed to go and study with her and her son, Julian, who is another amazing calligrapher at their house in Pennsylvania last year. Obviously that didn't happen, but I'm hoping it will still happen. She's 92. And this is my number one recommended resource. She's, she's very, she's traditionally taught. She was trained in England and she's just, you know, she just got it all going on. She just is really, really an amazing artist. I have this piece double the size of the original, not this big, but it's about, I don't know, about three feet wide. I have it hanging over my living room couch. And then this book right here, this is Gospels and Acts. And uh, this is part of the St. John's Bible. And I tell you a little bit about it in the resource list. You can go online and read more about it. I think 
personally, this is one of the most amazing calligraphy projects that has been created in my lifetime. Look at this. This is mostly very traditionally done. They did the entire Bible. It's about twice as big as this. You know, these are big books and it's twice as big as this roughly. And it was bound into seven volumes. They developed a calligraphy style specifically for this book. Well, they developed several of them, but one for the majority of the text. I fell in love with the style. So I had the opportunity to learn it from one of the people who was working on this project. They just finished it in 2010, 2011, something like that. And I saw the original. It was done on vellum with quills in 100 year old stick ink. It's an amazing project. If you want to see 500 calligraphers jaws drop simultaneously, bring in an original page from the St. John's Bible. You can go up to Minnesota and see it. It was primarily created in a scriptorium in Wales run by Donald Jackson, who was calligrapher to the Queen of England for quite a while. And uh, it was done for a university in Minnesota and it is now housed there permanently. So you can go up there and see it. Okay, all right. Yes, Sheila's there. Um, you should have two handouts in the handout link that I sent you. One of them is the resource list and the other one is specific to this class and tells you kind of the overview of what we're doing in this class. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get this done by three o'clock when we're supposed to end, but I'm going to do my best. This is the project. This is the project that I wanted to show you. When I teach this class in person, everybody does their own but I did not want to make everybody buy supplies and all that sort of thing. I mean, when I do this project, uh, when I do this class in person, I bring my supplies and share them with everybody. But since I can't do that through the internet, I'm just going to demonstrate it for you. So here's what I'm going to do. What you need is some watercolor paper. This is Arsh text wove paper. It's spelled arches, but it's pronounced Arsh because it's a French company. And um, you need some letters to either draw or trace, uh, whatever you feel more comfortable with. And this is, um, this is a Lombardic style cap from Hermann Zopf, who is an amazing calligrapher who died a few years ago uh, in his 90s. And what I've done is I've gone ahead and traced this. Now, you can take your letter and if you've got a light pad or light box, you can put this on the light pad or light box, put your paper over it, centering your paper over it, and then trace it. You know, the light will come through and you'll be able to see it behind it. I'm not pulling this over because it glares so much for the camera that it's really hard to see. And also it's kind of hard to get that thing out from there. But you can also just take this to a window with light coming through the window and then take your artist's tape or painter's tape, whichever, because that's low tack tape and it won't tear your paper. Um, and then just take this over it. I center my paper on the letter I want, and then I use my pencil and trace the outlines. So I'm going to set that aside. And then the next thing I'm going to do, where is my ruler? Oh, here it is. Okay. I am going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a pigment micron. And as I said, I'm going to go through this really fast because we only have half an hour and this project usually takes about an hour. So I'm going to be kind of rushing through this. So. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to trace over the pencil with my Pigma Micron. Can you see this? Pigma Micron 01. Most art supply places have this. The 01 is the second smallest size. This one is in black. And don't be afraid to turn your page. So you can see what you're doing here. And I'm trying to do this quickly but accurately because of the time crunch here. And 
this one is running out of ink. Let me get another one. I hate these. I keep a lot of these on hand because I go through them so fast. Oh, and by the way, you want to, if there's a diamond in it, like these have, a little diamond in it, you want to go ahead and draw the outlines of the diamond as well. So that's going to come up like so. And then we're going to come in here like this. And as I said, normally I would be taking more time with this because I'm pretty particular, but I don't want to keep you guys longer than we committed to. So I'm trying to get through this as quickly as I can, knowing that we're running kind of time on time. So I'm just tracing over all the edges. And if you have a letter that's closed, uh, you know, an enclosed letter, like an O, you need to draw the outlines of the counter space inside the letter O as well. Okay, so we've got that. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I am going to take my ruler and I'm going to draw, so I'm going to start with the pencil to make sure I don't run over. I'm going to draw straight lines with my ruler that go right up to the edges of, let's see, how am I going to do this? Do this one. Okay. Go right up to the edges of the letter. And I'm just kind of eyeballing this. And if you want to work on a grid and measure it to make sure it's square, be my guest. I don't usually bother, but sometimes I do. And if you want to use a different shape, not a square or a rectangle to do this, you can do that too. I think this one is not going to be as square as I'd like. But you know what? We're just going to call it good. There we go. As I said, normally I would be taking more time with this, but as it is, we are trying to get through it. Now, people who say, I can't even draw a straight line, well, guess what? I can't either. That's why God invented rulers. <laughs> I need to replace both of these pens. They are not happy with me. By the way, I am not really trying to teach you how to do this from start to finish. If that were the case, I would be giving you a handout with all the details step by step. And I really think that is off. And Cheryl, I don't know if you saw Edie's question in the uh, chat. Oh, I'm not no. able to access the resource list. Is there another site to get it? Um, Edie, were you able to get the um, the other handout? Because um, if you can get the one handout, you should be able to get the other handout because they're both together. And if you're still having difficulty, email me and I will see what I can do. So everybody, anybody who's having difficulty, there should be a link to the, um, to my Dropbox that has the, both of the handouts in it in the same email that you received the link to the Zoom in. Okay. Now, I've still got some pencil on there, but that's okay. It's going to disappear. So here's what we're going to do. 
we are going to take my, this is fine tech. I don't know if you can see this. This is fine tech watercolors. And this is my Arabic gold. See what I've done here? Because these are metallics, they look a lot different on dark and light paper. So what I've done with this one is I've taken a strip of light paper and a strip of dark paper, and I've painted a little swatch on there. So I know what it looks like because they look quite a bit different depending on what the background color is. So I've got a little water here and a little brush. And I'm going to take my Arabic gold, which is right here. And we're going to put a little distilled water in here, like so. There. And again, don't be afraid to turn your page. And by the way, if you do something like this, you want to make sure that the marker that you use to draw the outlines is waterproof, because otherwise it's going to bleed into your paint. So you want to make sure it's waterproof. So. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take one section at a time and we're going to paint the background in gold, like so. And as I said, I think I'm going to run out of time if I'm not careful. So. And you want to make sure there's plenty of pigment in there. As I said, turn your page if you need to. And I always tell students, make sure there's plenty of pigment in there. And the way to do that is when you think you're done, you hold the page up to the light and look for thin spots in your paint. And then you go back and put more paint in there. And as long as it's wet, you can always add more pigment if you need to. And you can paint it however you want. Uh, if you like to go around the edges or if you just like to work from one side to the other, that's fine. I like to go around the edges first and that way it's sort of contained. One of the nice things about using the waterproof marker is that it provides a little tiny bit of a sort of a curb like a curb on a street so that the the cars don't come up onto the sidewalk. This is kind of the same thing. It's a very low curb, but it's still a little bit of a curb. So there we go. Like that. So you see, I'm just moving pretty quickly here. Trying to get through this. And as one of my teachers always used to say, this is workshop life. It is not the same thing as studio life. When you're working in your studio, you usually have more time. And uh, if you're in a workshop, you don't always have all your supplies with you and the conditions aren't always ideal, which is often the case. So I'm just looking to get through this quickly because of our time crunch situation. I always try to pack too much into things, but uh, I'd rather give you as much as there is time for rather than leave you feeling like you didn't get what you were expecting. So we're going to go through this and just, you notice I'm just doing one area at a time. And whenever I work with watercolor, that's an important um, aspect of how to work with it. And I do not consider myself an expert in watercolor techniques. I know some stuff, but I am, I am not an expert watercolorist by any stretch of the imagination. So if you want to learn to paint realistic flowers in watercolor, I am not your girl. But 
if you want to learn to do stylized stuff that's traditionally used with letters, I can do that. So we're trying to get in the corners. And I usually use a brush that's no larger than size zero. And sometimes I'll use a couple of brushes, like one in size zero for the larger areas and one in zero zero or zero 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 for the tiny little areas that are harder to get into. So that's one way of doing it. There we go. Try to get that sort of filled in here. And by the way, you try not to go over the lines, but if it happens, it's not the end of the world. So what I'm doing here is I'm painting all of the background, oops, I have to go over there, all of the background that is not part of the letter. Okay, that's what I'm painting here. Everything inside the box that is not part of the letter is what I'm painting right now. There we go. And as I said, if it's still wet, if the paint on the page is still wet, you can add more pigment. Just uh, put a little thicker pigment on your brush and just dab it in there and it will what's called flood the area without you having to do a whole lot to it. And fill in this little area here. It's always a problem trying to get these little areas. As I said, it's not the end of the world if you go over an edge a little bit. It happens. And you, as long as you haven't gone too far outside the lines, you can fix it later. So that is that. Like so. And obviously it's better if you don't go over the edges, but it's not hopeless if you do. There we go. You don't have to be as careful with the metallics as you do with the second kind of paint we're going to be putting on that's actually going to go on the letter itself. With the gold, it's not quite as critical. Okay. Is there a question? I hear somebody unmuting themselves. Okay, so you see how this works, I hope. And now that I've gone all the way around the edge here, we're going to fill in the middle, like so. As I said, as long as it's still wet in that area, then you can come back in with more pigment and touch it in, like so. This is a kind of a large area work with. See, this is why I work with one area at a time and I try to finish off that area before I move on to another one because that way you don't have any issues with this didn't quite get done. It looks better that way. I mean you can still do it but it looks better. So, okay so that's more or less <laughs> this area. And now, uh, when you have one of these little diamonds, you go ahead and paint the diamond the same color as the background. So that's going to be painted gold as well. Let me get that in there. And you don't have to use this Arabic gold, but it's the most popular color. Most people like it the best, but you can see in my palette here, this is called the six gold palette. It's technically, it's five golds and one silver but they call it the six golds palette. So there we go. Okay, so that is that. Put a little bit more gold in there. 
There we go. Okay, now I'm going to rinse out my brush. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to paint the letter itself and make sure my brush is cleaned out nicely. So I'm just going to take some normal watercolor. See this? Just normal watercolor. Just basic pan watercolor. You can use higher quality watercolor if you want to. If you look at this, you'll notice it's the darker colors, the darker jewel tones that have been used the most. And uh, so these five colors, basically these four colors, plus these two here, are the ones that get used the most. For something like this, you want something that provides a nice contrast with the gold. And uh, so the, the darker jewel tones are generally the best choice for that. You want to choose darker colors for this because if you choose a lighter color, you can go lighter, but you can't go darker. So if you choose a darker color, then you have a wider range of possible, um, I'm trying to think what the correct term is, tints? I don't think that's quite right. Um, hues, I think it's hues. Uh, basically, you have a wider range of from darkest to lightest available to you if you choose one of the darker jewel tones. If you choose a lighter tone like this, you're never going to be able to get it to go that dark. This is the darkest you can get. So you're more limited in what's available to you. So you're better off if you work with one of the darker jewel tones and you want something that's gonna go well with the gold. So I think today I'm gonna to pick this teal color. So let me get a little bit of that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to paint this again, one area at a time. Let me get this back. Okay, so I'm going to take just a really light, I'm going to have a pretty wet brush with just a tiny touch of the color in it. Yeah, that'll work. And I'm just working on one area at a time. Okay, so I'm going to start with very, very, very pale color, just enough to show that it's in there. And you probably can't even see much of anything that I'm doing, but I can tell you I am actually painting it on there. There we go. Okay, now, now that I've put uh, water through the whole area, I'm going to add color. See what I'm doing here? So the water was already on there and I'm touching in to the wet areas. This is going to come down here like that. And what I'm doing is I'm putting the darker color around the edges and leaving the middle lighter. That gives a certain dimensionality to it. So I'm coming in and you want to keep this all wet. If it dries out, you get these unpleasant lines. Now, I just added more water in the middle, which will push the color towards the edges. And this is my preference as to how to do it. I like it better when, the, when it's darker around the edge. If you don't like it that way, you don't have to do it that way, but it does add a certain dimensionality. I think it makes it more interesting rather than just doing it one flat color. It's not as interesting that way, in my opinion. So that's how you do it. And if you want to, if you feel like you've gotten too much color in the middle and you want to take some out or anywhere else, you can take a paper towel or Kleenex or toilet paper or something like that and just touch it to the middle part. See that? And if you find that it's too harsh, a variation. You can come in with a wet brush and soften it up like so. So you see how that works? So you see how the color is more concentrated around the edges? So you work with one area until you're happy with it and then you move on to another area. Let's see, get some more water on here like so. And there we go. This is not quite wet enough. There we go. 
So I've just got a little color in here. So with watercolor, you always start lighter and work darker. Always, always, always. Um, you can, as I just showed you, you can take out some of the color if you need to, but depending on how wet it is, it can be more difficult to do it that way. It's much easier if you darken things up as you go along rather than try to lighten them up. It's much more challenging to lighten them up, especially if it's gotten dry. So you keep it wet and then touch in some color from the corners and the edges, like so. Add a little bit more. I'm going to pull this along here, like so. See, I'm just touching it in and it's spreading out. I don't know how well you can see this. There you go. Now it's puddling in a place where I don't want it to be. So I'm going to touch it with the paper towel again and pull out some of that color. So, okay. And now I'm going to soften this up a little bit. So it's not quite so dramatic a change. There we go. And sometimes you can take a fairly dry brush and use that to pull some of the color out as well. So those are some things that you can do. Let's see how we're doing here. Not too well. There's a couple more steps here, and I don't think I can do it in three minutes, so. <laughs> We're just going to do the best we can. As I keep saying to all my students, we're all just doing the best we can. So. Okay, so one more. And when you get a fuzzy on your brush, go get that off. Yes, almost finished with this part. So the rest of it is I'm going to add, I think what I'm going to do is show you a completely finished one. So there's, there's a few more steps to go. And the next step is to draw basically what I call a moat around the outside of the box. And basically it's just another box. It's another container around the box that's already there. And uh, just a little bit bigger. Oh, that was lovely, I need my gold here. Um, so you're basically containing the box in a very slightly larger box that's even uh, evenly spaced around it. And if you wanna do something special on the corners, of that box, you can. I often do. And uh, then I usually add dots around the edge of the outer box as well. There we go. Some more water here. And then um, the final step before you sign it and date it is to emboss the gold. And I'm not sure if it's going to be dry enough to emboss the gold. We'll see here in a minute. Yeah, that's too much water over here. There we go. Okay, a little more down there. Like that. And that's done. And now we're going to take out a little bit of this water. There we go. So we're going to pull out some of this. There we go. Okay. And then soften this up. Like so. 
There we go. Okay. So, did you guys see that? See that dimensionality because it's darker around the edges? Now, let me grab something here. Hang on. This invariably happens to me. You would not believe how much stuff I have sitting around <laughs> my desk, and I realized there was something I forgot that I wanted to show you guys. So let me pull this out. Hang on just a second. Here we go. All right. So, setting that aside, here we are. These are finished versions of what we were just doing. Yeah. So all of these have the same basic setup. Uh, they were all, well, these two were painted exactly the same way as what you just saw me do. This one is a little bit different. It's, it's a little bit more elaborate in the boxes around it. But, you know, it started out the same way. I just put more boxes around it. And this one, instead of using regular watercolor, let me pull this up here so maybe you can see it a little bit better. Instead of using regular watercolor to paint the letter, it, um, it's done with a different color of fine tech watercolor paint. So it's done, the letter itself is done with a metallic as well as the gold background. So that's why both the letter and the background are shiny. So you see what I did here? I drew, let me show you on this one instead. So you see, I've got my inner box, just like the one that I already did for you. And then I've drawn an outer box, just a little bit bigger, but I've done these sort of crown shapes on the corners. And you can do whatever you want on the corners. This just happens to be the one that I like best. You see what I've done a different version of it here. You know, it's just, I've extended those crown corners. And then I went ahead and added this other box underneath. Now, uh, oh, and I put little dots all the way around the edge. And by the way, the additional box and the dots, those are all done with this same Pigma Micron. Same thing, same tool. And then the dots, basically, I just keep a little distance away from the outer border and try to keep the dots evenly spaced. And I don't plan out the dots. I just try to keep them evenly spaced and just go all the way around. And you just keep turning the page so you're always approaching it the same way. Now, everybody is saying, how did you do the lines and the diamonds in the gold, right? Everybody wants to know how that's done. OK, I do not know if this is dry enough yet. I think it is. Let's try it. Okay, I am going to take, this is the last stage here, I'm going to take a pad of paper, just any old pad of paper, and I'm flipping it over so that, if I can get this done here, so that the backing, the, the cardboard backing of the pad of paper is facing up. Then I'm going to take this tool right here. This is, I've listed it on the, um, on the handout that's specifically for this class. This is a Kemper uh, double ball stylus, and there's a little bitty ball on each end, and you notice this one is bigger than this one. And I told you on the handout which one to get. This is the large size, the Kemper large size. You can get it from Blick Art Materials, other places may have it. You may be able to get it online or whatever, but I know Blick has it for about $3 US dollars. It's not very expensive. Um, I do not recommend that you get a smaller one because if you use the ones with the smaller balls, they may rip your paper, especially if your paper is still a little bit wet um, because it acts like a little, you know, a little knife. But if you use this size, you would have to work really hard to rip the paper. So it shouldn't be a problem. So here's what we're gonna do. These little balls, this is called an embossing tool, and the little balls are going to press 
like so. I think I'm going to make a starburst design. So I'm using the smaller ball for lines, and I'm going to use the large ball for dots. So you see the lines here? I made that with the smaller ball, and these dots, like so, I used the larger ball for that. And it's very important when you do this, you have to have some padding underneath. The paper has to have some place to go when you press on it or you're not gonna get much of an impression. And you press as hard as you can. It's very important for this ink to be dry and you only do it on the metallic. So um, you don't do it on the non-metallic watercolor, okay? And I'm gonna do a starburst pattern. So I'm gonna start in the middle and I'm pressing hard and I think this is still a little wet so it's not going to show up quite the same way but we're just gonna make do and by the way I do not use a ruler for this because nobody is going to notice I guarantee you if <laughs> the lines aren't perfectly straight so you jump over the parts of the letter that you come to, okay? And you press as hard as you can without ripping through the paper. Jump over the letter. Now we're gonna do this. Like so. And a lot of times I do that checkerboard pattern, but I like the starburst pattern as well. And you can use whatever regular geometric pattern you want to on the background. I do recommend that you use some dots in there uh, because the reason we're doing this in the first place is, you know how when you look at something that's metallic, um, it really makes a difference what direction you look at it from you know, because some directions it's much more reflective than other directions. Well, this helps with that problem. You don't have to stand in exactly the right place in order to see it reflect. So what happens here is, and also this is the reason you only do it on the metallic, is that you are creating different angles for the metallic to reflect when you do this because you're creating an indentation. Well, the, the little ditch or the indentation is going to have a bunch of different angles that the metal uh, paint or whatever is going to reflect from. So you'll notice it sparkling from different directions. You see that? You see how it much more noticeably sparkly it is. Now, I do recommend that you include some dots. And again, you use the larger end for that. The reason I recommend that you include some dots is because if you don't have to move it, you can press much harder. See how much more noticeable that dot is than the lines? Do you see that? So I'm gonna go around and press as hard as I can. And if the place in your pattern where you would normally put a dot is covered up by the letter, see right here, it's borderline, just skip it and move on to the next area. See that? Now I'm gonna go through here again and put more of them in there. There we go. And you have to put the lines far enough apart that you can fit the dots in between them because it creates this sort of little depression. See that? Look at that. Remember what it looked like before I did this? You notice how much more sparkly it is now? Because I created all these angles that the metal will reflect on. So that is how you do that. And as I said, this one isn't finished because it doesn't have that second border and the dots around it, and it's not signed and dated. But other than that, this is done. So 
It's not too bad. We went 10 minutes over and hopefully this will all be on the recording for those who had to leave. So I hope this has been educational and entertaining for everybody. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Ken, do you want to switch back over to my face camera so I can talk to everybody and they don't have to just look at the same thing? <laughs> sure. And I don't know um, if you saw, there was a few people who mentioned in the chat they were not finding the unseal uh, alphabet. Um, that's not in there. That is not in among the handouts. The unctual alphabet is not in there. That's something that I give everybody when they take the unctual class. And if you want to know more about what unctual looks like, then you can go online and look, uh, you know, just Google unctual calligraphy images and you'll see what that looks like. Um, but yeah, I, I give it tons of exemplars to everybody when they take the class, when they study that, but this class was not designed to teach people to write in a style, so I didn't include an alphabet for that. I Can you send me the link? Can you send me the link? The link to how what? The, the, how to do the letters that you were just doing. Um, that is something that I teach in, in more detail in all of almost all of my beginner classes. So that's why I didn't include it for this class because I wasn't trying to teach you specifically how to do that. But, and how do you uh, spell the, that word that you just said? Uh, which word was that? The one, the, the letters. Unctual? Yeah. Um, U-N-C-I-A-L. Like U-N... U-N-C-I-A-L. C-I-A-L. Yeah. That's how you spell it, U-N-C-I-A-L. Yes. And then I can see the, all the letters on there. Mm -hmm. And when do you have your classes? Oh, yes. Thank you for reminding me. I have uh, put together a new class. If anybody is inspired and says, yes, I want to start studying at the beginning, I have a class starting on, I think it's the 17th of July. Let me double check. I just put this together. Yes, July 17th. It's the same time of day, same day of the week as this class. It's in about a month from now. And um, so we will be starting that class then. So if you are ready to start from the beginning or uh, even if you've already been doing calligraphy and you want to study unctual with me, that class will be starting in about a month on uh, July 17th. It's a 10-week class, but there are some gaps in it. So it goes through, I think, September. Um, I think that's when it ends because there's a few weeks in there that we have to jump over for, you know, holidays, vacations, other classes that I already have planned, things like that. And by the way, uh, there were 200 people plus signed up for this class, and I'm limited to 12 for most of the classes I teach, including all the ones that I've mentioned to you. So you can do the math. <laughs> the one that I'm teaching next week, the Celtic Knots class, that one's half full already. So uh, if you want to take that one, you want to jump in. And all of those classes are listed on Eventbrite, and I think, Ken, I think you have them on the information as well? Yeah, yeah. If you go to the stlpenshow.com website and click schedule, you'll see uh, Cheryl's other two classes that she's doing for us, the uh, Celtic Knots and the Artistic Envelopes one. And those are both listed and the, there's a registration link uh, alongside each one to take you to Eventbrite to sign up. Yes. The the unctual class that I was talking about is not part of the St. Louis Pen Show uh, instruction. So that is not going to be listed with the Pen Show classes. But if you go on Eventbrite and do a search on my name, you'll be able to find it there. Or if you have any difficulty, you can email me. If you have questions about anything, if you still can't find the information that I sent to you with the, um, uh, the handouts, just email me and I'll be happy to help you if I can. Um, I always want to tell people that I don't, I don't want anybody to feel like once the class is over, I'm done and I won't 
answer questions or anything. I'm happy to answer questions whenever. Anybody who's been one of my students, I'll be happy to answer your questions whenever. Um, if you get into a bunch of questions and you need a lot of individual help, then we may have to start talking about doing some sort of paid tutoring arrangement, but I'm happy to answer questions for you. You know, uh, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help. So please let me know. Um, I am also teaching decorated letter classes coming up. I've got a decorated letter. It's called decorated letter two, but I don't want anybody to feel like, oh, I have to have taken decorated letter one first. No, you don't. You don't have to have taken decorated letter one first. That is coming up on July 1st. Uh, that's when that class starts. And um, that is 10 weeks. We learn different decorative techniques every single week. It's a lot of fun. Uh, my, my students who have taken decorated letter classes, I've got three of them. They're all nine or 10 weeks each. Uh, my students really seem to love those. As a matter of fact, the first one, it was 10 weeks and the students said, I wish it was twice as long. So I said, okay, let me see what I can come up with. Hence, decorated letter two was formed because the students wanted more. So I said, okay, let me go back and see what decorative techniques I had on the list that I didn't have time to teach in the 10 weeks that I thought people would sit still for. So um, I pulled out more and now I've got decorated letter three because the same thing happened with decorated letter two. People said, we still want more. So, okay, let me see what else I can come up with. So uh, that, that class is coming up too. So we'll see how it goes. So. And I teach copper plate and continuing copper plate and all the beginning classes and, you know, all sorts of stuff. So um, I've given you links if you want to know more about my classes. I've given you links to, um, you can email me and be put on my notification list for all of my future classes. You know, you get updated. And it's no spam. I don't send your information to anybody. It's completely spam free. Um, and also I've given you a link if you wanna to go to my Dropbox, there is uh, information in there. There's two um, uh, spreadsheets that have all of my upcoming classes on them. And then there's a Word document with a bunch of information about my classes. And most of them are also on Eventbrite. You can go on Eventbrite and Google my name. There's probably about 20 classes coming up for the rest of the year, uh, so. I, I went on Eventbrite today just to double check and Google my name on Eventbrite and nothing came up and I said, okay, what's wrong with this? I know I've got a bunch of classes on here. And I realized I hadn't uh, clicked the button to say include online classes because right now all of my classes are online. So uh, make sure you've got the, <laughs> the settings set correctly. So, well, I hope this has been helpful. Does anybody have any questions or anything? And don't be intimidated. If you're a lefty, you can still do calligraphy. Uh, I know that uh, at least one person who's been calligrapher for the White House has been a lefty. So, you know, it's not a fatal error to, to be a lefty. If you want to do calligraphy, it can be done. It may be more challenging, but if you're a lefty, you're used to challenges. <laughs> I can guarantee that. So you can do it. All right. Uh -huh. Any just quickly, do you cover different kinds of paper? Like I'm interested in deckled edges and just different ways to really beautify the paper um, or for presentations. So I don't know if you go over that in any of your classes. Um, you were cutting in and out a little bit, so I lost oh, a little sorry. bit of what you said. Um, so were you asking me about uh, do I go over different kinds of paper? Is that what you were asking me? Right. For example, deckled edges, like, do you have suppliers that you particularly will talk about or, or kinds of paper mm -hmm. besides just the two that you've talked about today? Yes. Yeah. So, just because this was only a two hour class and I was just trying to cram so much yeah. into it, as I, as I think you probably realized, I didn't have time to go into everything that I would have liked to share with you, but yes, in my beginner class, I, I um, have extensive information about different kinds of paper, what I recommend, why I recommend this one for this kind of thing, and why I recommend this one for this kind of thing. I have a list of different ones that you can try. I make suggestions as to what to do so you can try for yourself. And, you know, maybe you have different preferences than I do, but here's what to do to figure out what to get that sort of thing. So yeah, I go over that in detail. That's one of the things that I include in that 10 week uh, you know, brand new beginner classes that I teach, because that's one of the things that I really want you to know about 
once you get started with calligraphy, you, can, you need to know about ink, you need to know about paper, you need to know about pens. I talk about all that stuff in my uh, beginning calligraphy one class, the Angshou class. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Other questions? I'm looking. Ken, did I miss anything? Or did I shortchange anything? May I ask? Um... I have been looking at gum Arabic recently, but I find it to be very intimidating. Do you have any recommendations of whether to use crystals or um, sort of already liquid? Um, gum Arabic? Yes, I can talk about that. I always use the liquid gum Arabic and I'll tell you why. It's probably not as cheap, but the reason is the last time I used the powdered gum Arabic, it started molding on me and nobody wants that. So even though it would make more sense for liquid gum Arabic to mold first, um, it was the opposite way around for me. So it's sort of the once bitten twice shy <laughs> kind of thing. Um, if I ran out of liquid gum Arabic, I would use the powdered gum Arabic and add it to distilled water or vice versa, you know, depending on which one you put in first. Um, but I prefer using the liquid gum Arabic. Um, and this is one of the things that I talk about in my mastering dip pens class. By the way, for anybody who's interested, my beginner sequence goes like this. Uh, first class is beginning calligraphy one, uh, also known as unctual. I have that in parentheses. That's the first week, first class. It's 10 weeks long. The second class is eight weeks long and it is beginning calligraphy two in parentheses, italic. That's when I introduce italic and a bunch of other stuff. Um, the third class is mastering dip pens. And that's when we transition from the cartridge pens that I was showing you at first, these, um, these kind of pens, the, the parallel pens. That's what we use in the first two courses. In the third course, we start getting into dip pens, which is what I use all the time when I'm not teaching. I basically never use parallel pens unless I'm teaching or I'm just doing some quick large signs. The rest of the time I use parallel, I, I use dip pens, excuse me, because they're a more precise instrument and you have a lot more options in the inks that you can use. So that's why professionals always, almost always use dip pens, you know, not always, but most of the time. Um, so that class is helping you get used to those because they're trickier to use. So we have an entire six week class to transition you to working with dip pens and working with gouache, which is the kind of ink that I prefer for colors. Um, I use stick ink for black ink and for colors, I mostly use gouache. And then um, for metallics, I use fine tech. So that's generally what I do. And so we take six weeks. We're not learning a new style. We're not working in, uh, mostly not working in different sizes than we're used to. We're just learning to work with the new tools and inks. And you need that time. You, you know, you're not going to be sitting around twiddling your thumbs in that class. You're going to be working hard. Um, but we take six weeks to do that. And in that class, I also teach you about things like error correction and working smaller and teach you about different kinds of ink. I have one session on metallic and white inks and one session on non-metallic inks. And I teach you about other kinds of tools like working with this thing, the ruling pen. How do you make lines with the ruling pen? I teach you how to do that in that class. And I have a session on error correction because everybody makes mistakes. How do you fix them? You know, so that is that class and you're working hard at home trying to get used to the new materials. And that sets you up to transition to the fourth and final of the beginner classes, which is beginning copper plate. That's when you start working with pointed pen, because up to this point, you've only been working with broad edge pen. So you start working with pointed pen with copper plate, and that's a whole different animal. So you're learning a new style and a somewhat new uh, tool as well. So I teach you about all that stuff. By the time you finish that, oh, and the beginning copper plate class is eight weeks. So you've got 10 weeks, eight weeks, six weeks, and eight weeks. So when you add all that up, what, what does it come up to? Uh, 32 weeks, something like that. So that's 
a pretty good chunk of a year. But by the time you get done with that, if, even if you knew nothing about calligraphy other than you wanted to learn to do it before you started, you will have a solid foundation in styles, techniques, papers, inks, tools, error correction, uh, finished projects, because you do finished projects in all of these classes, um, you know, working with different sizes, working on different surfaces, you know, all this stuff. You have this whole solid foundation. And once you've taken my entire beginner sequence, you can do almost anything. You know, you may need more practice, but you can do almost anything with calligraphy um, because you have that solid foundation and it's not going to be so intimidating. So that's how I designed it to give you that solid foundation so that you can go out and do anything you want to do with calligraphy because you've had at least a taste of almost anything. One of the things that I don't do is brush calligraphy um, because I'm not an expert in that, but there's other people out there who can teach you that. So, you know, but other than that, you've got a lot of stuff under your belt if you finish that entire four course sequence. Now, if you've had some of those courses in other places, you don't necessarily have to start at the beginning. Um, it's always nice to have people start at the beginning because then they get everything in the order that I want to teach it to them so that it flows naturally and it makes sense. But um, if you've already, you know, like one of my students, she's already taken copper plate from two or three other teachers. So she's not taking that one from me, but she's done all the other beginner classes. Okay, you know, if that's, if that's uh, how it worked out for you, okay, that's fine, you know. So um, I don't know, was there any other questions that I missed? Um, if the nib feels really scratchy on the paper and the ink doesn't flow, could this then, then be the wrong paper? That's possible. Uh, another possibility is, it, especially if it's a pointed nib, and usually that's when you get a scratchy nib, um, uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm interrupting myself by reading what uh, everybody's having to say. If what I always say to people is, other than the operator, there's three main factors in how well your calligraphy is going. One is the tool, in other words, the pen. One is the surface, in other words, the paper. And the other is the fluid. In other words, the ink. Anytime you change any of those three things, you're going to have a whole different experience. That's why in my beginner class, I have the students work with the parallel pen on different kinds of paper because it's going to be a different experience when you work on a different kind of paper, even though the pen and the ink are the same. If it's different paper, it's going to be a different experience. And the same thing, I uh, with my beginner students, when we do this in person, I give them a sampler pack of paper. Uh, when it's online, I tell you what to order. So you end up with a sampler pack of paper. And um, what I tell you to do is, okay, try this, these different papers with your parallel pen, leave some room on those papers so that assuming you continue on to the dip pen class and the copper plate class, you have some room on those sampler sheets to try a different pen and a different ink because that will be helpful because you may like one paper with a certain kind of pen and ink and hate it with another kind of pen and ink. You just never know until you try it. So it could be the nib, it could be the paper, it could be the ink. So it could be any of those three things. Um, a lot of times when the nib is scratchy, either if the nib is, is a pointed nib, it's probably one of two things. Either the paper is not happy with the nib. So it's a paper problem. The paper is too rough or actually two other things. One is your nib is worn out. That's how you know when a nib is worn out is it starts getting scratchy. Number three is it may be that the nib is not worn out, but it's getting ink clogged up in it. And uh, so you just need to clean it and it'll be okay. But the thing is, most pointed nibs do not last that long. I have a colleague who works a little bit faster than I do. Um, I can address about 100 envelopes in a day comfortably. 
if everything is working right, <laughs> um, she can address about 120 envelopes in, in a day comfortably if everything's working right. So she works a little bit faster than I do. She says that, and she exclusively works in pointed pen. You know, I go back and forth. I've, I've got both hats. Um, she says that she throws away at least one pointed nib a day. That's how fast they wear out. And the more flexible they are, the faster they wear out. The more stiff ones, they last a lot longer. So, so it could be a lot of different things. So, oh, I have a question. Do you stream online? I would listen and watch you work. Well, what I do is I'm currently teaching online, just like this class, except usually with fewer people. So you can interact with me more. And, um, you know, I, I try to respond to people and evaluate their work, you know, give them feedback because with a class of 12 people or fewer, uh, I'm more able to do that than I can in a class of 200 people. But in my smaller classes, which is most of them, I can, uh, I have students send me their work and then I give them feedback and evaluate it. So, uh, oh, and what I do with my other classes that I teach online, and I'm not sure where exactly this is going to be um, posted. Yeah, can I see you need to wrap this up? I'm not sure exactly where this is going to be posted or how long, but normally with my classes that are done online, you get to keep the recording. I give you the recording to keep. I don't know any other calligraphy teacher who's teaching online right now who gives you the recording to keep. Everybody else says you can have it for a week, two weeks, a month, six weeks, but eventually it's gone. I give it to you. If you've got room on your hard drive, you can save it and keep it and you can go back and watch it. So, okay. Um, there is some difference between the pointed pen that I use and a fountain pen with a flex nib. Um, it's, it's a more delicate instrument. It's more flexible. That's why it wears out faster. The, the metal gets fatigued and it just won't snap back. Fountain pens are usually stiffer, so they last longer. Yeah. Okay. Did I miss anything? Ken, did I miss anything? I think that's everything. Uh, I got to wrap up because I've got another one here pretty soon, but thank you right. so much, Cheryl. This was awesome. Very inspiring. And Thanks to everybody who came today. This was yes. uh, a huge crowd. I don't know if we're going to match this again uh, <laughs> through this entire uh, series, but um, yeah, it was good. Thank you. Well, thank everybody, you thank you so much. Thank you so much. And please let me know if there's anything I can do to help. You all have my email. Just let me know. And thank you also, Ken, for managing this for me. This is so much easier than when I have to manage all my tech stuff for my classes myself. So thank you. you thank bet. you very much. Thanks, You're everyone. Welcome. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.